and it's slowly arrived that well, any particle was uh, subject to the same movement, so uh, it has nothing to do with life. So my point now is Einstein. Uh, at the same time, Einstein was uh, interested to demonstrate the existence of atoms. But again, we could not see atoms, especially at, at the time. So the genius uh, of Einstein was trying to see if we can have a bridge between microscopic and macroscopic worlds. He done that for, uh, for the uh, paper he published in 1905 on the relativity theory, which is projecting ourselves in a, in a world where the, uh, the speed is the speed of light. Well, what he used as a his speedy thesis, and then he published in the same year, 1905, he showed that uh, the Boolean motion and diffusion were uh, in fact the same phenomenon that was not clear at the time. And uh, his idea was to demonstrate that if we can measure diffusion coefficient uh, and link it with the theory of heat, that would demonstrate indirectly the presence of atoms. So, Basically, his idea was to, to demonstrate something at a microscopic level while observing something at a macroscopic level. So, my point now is, uh, in 1984, let's see here, with more years, um, I was to, uh, it was the beginning of MRI, and uh, you would get images like that. As, uh, if you are not a uh, doctor, you can see that there is something wrong here. That's what we see. The scale is millimeter, but uh, as a uh, physician, we'd like to understand what's going on in the tissue at the microscopic scale. So my idea was that if there is a way to measure the Brunner motion of water, we might get some information. The water molecules will see obstacles and will give us some information about what they see. And we are very lucky, it was based on the work of Einstein, if we take the diffusion coefficient of water at the brain temperature. Um, the displacement of the water molecules for free water, I mean not, not in tissue like that, but in free water, let's say 50 milliseconds, during that time molecules will move on a distance of about 50 micrometers. We are exactly at the right scale. By measuring diffusion of water in tissues, we get some information at a microscopic level. So it's like a polygray virtual biopsy. And it is the same idea that Einstein used in 1905, trying to get some microstructure information from images which are applied at the microscopic resolution. So, how we do that? I don't want again to bother you with its physical details, but instead of using a very homogeneous magnetic field, the magnetic field now will change, let's say from left to right or from top to bottom, whatever direction, this is what we call a gradient, and if molecules or water move, Along this gradient, the, uh, the phase, the phase that we get when we do the radio frequency excitation, will be will be lost, and this translates into a signal attenuation, which we can measure accurately to get a uh, TID of the diffusion coefficient. If one of move a lot, we get a big signal attenuation. If they move only a little bit, so slow diffusion, the attenuation is that's easy. And so when I published the very first paper in 1980. Five or six, it was received with some uh, surprise that how could we measure diffusion? But soon it became evident that the uh, potential was huge. And um, as I show you, it's used now in stroke to make diagnosis <coughs> in the people and save lives, brain connectivity, cancer diagnosis, and brain functional MRI. And uh, um, also it's used early. The uh, explanation underlying what we see is not so well understood. And this is how water, I will show you, might have a very important contribution. So it seems that cell swelling or anisotropy of water in, 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 white, in white matter in the brain and um, soil proliferation and so on are, are somewhat responsible for what we see. So that's what I will show you. But the main point I'd like to make is that there are now about 20. 20,000 articles published uh, using diffusion MRI. So, if you keep uh, diffusion MRI in Google Scholar, so it's huge. It's used every day in many, many fields. But um, the mechanisms are still poorly understood. 
So just to show you that um, sometimes even if one understands something, uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't mean that something is not useful. So I think it's something I don't uh, waste. So the very first application of diffusion MRI is acute stroke. Acute stroke, so this patient, in fact, I showed the photo earlier, has a stroke. What is a stroke? That means that there is a clot on an artery and the blood cannot go to the brain. So the brain tissue will die very quickly. We lose about 2 billion of euros per minute when this occurs. And it's a disaster, the first common cause of death. The first cause by far of long term disability is the cost is huge socially, emotionally, and so on. And uh, there's nothing to do. Once this part of the brain is dead, the patient may get pathetic, not able to speak anymore, or hemiplegic. It's a disaster. So back in 1990, Mike Mosley, a friend of mine in the UCSF, was using my method, diffusion MRI, in a model of a stroke in the cat. And what he discovered, immediately after the clot had, uh, was formed, the diffusion coefficient of water was going down immediately. And, uh, and uh, so these are conventional images, MRI images. We see one, two, four hours, nothing to see. While with diffusion MRI, it was obvious that something was going on. So this is now used every day in hospitals. Um, this is a patient, for instance, who had a stroke. You see the uh, MRI images are not, uh, we don't see anything. With diffusion white imaging, we see clearly that there are two areas under the stroke. So the good news is that at the same time as diffusion MRI was used uh, for the first time in stroke, a company in the United States developed a drug called RTPA, which can dissolve uh, the clot. So if you have uh, some symptoms of stroke today, you are rushed to the hospital in the emergency uh, department, and they will do MRI diffusion. If they see that, they will give you the RTPA, dissolve the clot. And you, I have seen myself, so in a patient which arrived on a right with him in Pleja, in, in, in just one minute. Just one minute. Unfortunately, there are not so many patients uh, who can get everything because uh, the symptoms are not always clear. If you have big pain here, you know that you may have a heart attack and you know what to do. For a uh, stroke, symptoms are not always so obvious. Anyway, my, my, uh, my lecture is not about stroke, it's to explain why you have diffusion as diffusion slowdown. So this is very clear, it's a huge effect. 30 to 50 percent increase in diffusion. We know it's related to some swelling of the cells, but the mechanism is still not clear at all. Second major application. It was discovered by the same a friend of mine, Mike Mosley, using diffusion MRI in the early 1990s, that diffusion of water is anisotropic in white matter. So um, if you are not a specialist of the brain, just remind you that Neurons are essentially uh, located at the surface, what we call the gray matter, the cortex, and white matter is everything we see because there are uh, connections, axons, we call them axons, connecting different regions of the brain. So it was discovered that water molecules which are diffusing, uh, um, the, the diffusion coefficient is, is less perpendicular to the fibers than in the direction of the fibers. So this could be understood from a mechanistic point of view. If you consider axons as cylinders, it's clear that water molecules have a harder time to, to go perpendicularly to the axons than in the direction of the axons. So this is a naive cartoon, and I believe that it doesn't explain everything, but still that's what people have in mind. And back then, so uh, I was starting to do some air, as you can see. Um, uh, we developed with colleagues at the United States a technique called diffusion tensor imaging, which we patented, to obtain images uh, to provide uh, on a point by point basis the orientation in space of the white matter fiber. <coughs> the idea that we measure diffusion in several directions, and in the direction where diffusion is the highest, we assume that it is the direction of the fibers. And we repeat that in many directions, and we can obtain images like that, and then using some um, uh, software, uh, we can, in mathematical algorithms, we can connect each point to trace uh, the connections. So this is something which we started in 1998, 
and which is now booming. Uh, these are the images we get now. Um, NIH has given 50 million of dollars to establish the human brain connecton. Okay. Uh, in Europe, we got only 2 million of uh, euros, but we were faster. This is, this is the atlas of brain connection obtained in one subject. We have now 100 of them. It takes about 15 minutes. And we can get uh, images of the brain connections uh, like that. Uh, just in 15 to 20 minutes. And again, using water uh, uh, and the anisotropy of water diffusion in the brain. And recently, uh, colleagues from MIT have obtained uh, uh, images in animal models with a resolution of 200 micrometers, and you see all these circuits. Uh, so, you, just to show you that even if we don't understand completely <coughs> what is in this water, uh, we can use water uh, to obtain a really, really interesting information on how the brain works. It is now shown, for instance, that in, in some patients with schizophrenia, uh, the anatomy of the brain is normal, um, the function of the brain is normal, they hear voices and the uh, uh, auditory cortices are activated. But what could be wrong are the connections between, for instance, the frontal and the temporal areas. We found also that in two months or four months old babies, well before they start speaking, uh, there is an asymmetry in the connection between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. You know, the right hemisphere is usually associated with language. So this comes very early in life because the connections are already uh, established for that. The next stage um, is uh, how you see how the brain works, and that is what we call um, fMRI, functional MRI. So uh, this is a study cartoon, it's not so far from the truth. For many, many years, the way we learned how the brain works was uh, by during surgery to, to punch some areas of the brain and see. Uh, what's what's in fact the patient would be not anesthetized. This is still used in fact, by the way, not in a such a caricature way, but it is used. Mm -hmm. So it is possible today to obtain images of, of brain function. And so when you see the brain, for instance, you have to take any parts of the brain and, and especially the visual areas. So let me show you um, how it's done. And then we we'll switch to a new method which I developed a few years ago, where water is playing a very important role. So it's still water. This technique which was invented by Seiji Ogawa, a Japanese friend, uh, it's called Paul for blood oxygen level demand FMRI. The idea is that um, this is quite a discovery name, um, red blood cells contain contain hemoglobin, and hemoglobin contains an atom of iron, which in the, in the strong field of the magnetics of MRI uh, becomes magnetic. So in a in short, we have to consider red blood cells as uh, tiny magnets, and when they circulate into the blood, uh, they will modify the field locally, and this will be uh, seen in the, in the MRI signal. But what is important to understand is this there is a coupling between blood flow, metabolism, and activation. So when we use parts of our brain, locally there is an increase in blood flow. So if you have an increase in blood flow, you change the magnetization of the water molecules because there is more blood source from to the active. So it has worked beautifully. Just to give you an example of where we are now, this guy in the magnet is playing this game with seashells, paper, and uh, stone. So he's moving the top like that. Then, of course, with MRI, we can see changes in the magnetization of uh, the hydrogen nuclei in the motor cortex. The signal is analyzed by a computer and then sent to a robot, an artificial pen with some very small engines. And the, uh, the hand is just following what the, the guy is doing inside the magnet. The next step now, the guy is not doing anything, he's just thinking. And uh, we've shown, probably just 15 years ago now, or even more, that even by just thinking, you activate the brain in a very similar way. So this guy is just thinking about moving his hand, and you see the hand moving according to his thoughts. So that's what's done every day now, and this is something really confused for MRI, fMRI people. And just to show you how far uh, this can be used, this is a lady in a comatose state, 26 years old after the accident, no response. And uh, our um, colleagues, uh, the team of Dr. Owen, um, just thought about let's put this patient in the MRI scanner just to see. So they asked the lady, What's your name? Of course, nothing. But in the MR images, what they've seen is that the areas, which vocal areas which are known to be activated by language, were activated. 
So this lady was not only understanding the question, but she was answering. So then she asked, they asked her, could you imagine that you are playing tennis? And nothing happens. Looking at the images, you see that some regions of the brain get activated the same, which are activated in normal people with the same thinking. Or could you think that you are moving in your house? You are just looking at the different rooms in your house. Different regions are activated, same as in normal people. So this now has been observed in about 20% of the patients in the vegetative state. And again, in order to see that, we use the magnetization of adrenaline. And some people are communicating with those patients. For instance, they say, well, I will ask you a question. If you want to say yes, you think you play the tennis. If you want to say no, you think you navigate in your house. And, and then they get a yes no response and communicate with patients who are in the digital state. Looks good, right? So it is good and it is heavily used now. But now I'd like to point out that there are some um, short, short uh, uh, pitfalls that I would like to, to address. And the reason for this increase in blood flow is not so clear. We don't know exactly the mechanism. Also, it's, we are not looking really at neural activity, we are looking at something indirect. And the response is so much fuzzy, it takes about six seconds uh, between the beginning of the stimulation and the time the increase in blood flow gets at the at peak, which of course is much lower than how the brain works. And also the localization is not so clear. So for, for years now, I have introduced a new idea that they have to use water diffusion MRI to obtain images of brain function. And, and this is something which could be related really to uh, surveillance neuronal activation. So this is the experiment I've done back in, 19, in 2005 with my Japanese colleagues. Um, so we used visual stimulation to present light on and off. And with all fMRI, we see activation in the visual areas, it's no surprise. But what was surprising to some colleagues, not to me, because that's what I wanted to see, in the visual cortex, there is very clear and beautiful activation. And um, when we look at the curve, uh, we obtain this is ball. So again, as I said, this is a stimulation, 10 seconds. We see something which is related to the increase in blood flow. This is end of the stimulation and the peak occurs a little bit later. If we look at the diffusion signal now, what we see is that there is an increase it's now which translates into decreased diffusion. So water diffusion goes down each time the brain is activated. But if you look at the time course now, what we see is that the, the change in water diffusion is much faster, starts much quicker, and ends immediately at the end of stimulation. Something which points out to a uh, not a vascular uh, phenomenon, but something related really to neuronal activity. Something which is related to the tissue. This was in 2005-2006. Many, many of my colleagues have been skeptical, have looked for pitfalls. So I published uh, uh, this year a paper in PNS. Uh, this was shown in 2012, it was all the this year. I, I think this is quite convincing. It's done in the right brain, and we have stimulated the pole, the right. And we call uh, it to, uh, physiological signals with diffusion and ball. This is what we see. Activation of is observed with diffusion and with the ball method. No surprise. But if we give to the animal natural pushing, which is a drug which is interfering with the neurovascular activity, so there is no more increase in blood flow, you see that the ball response disappears, but the diffusion response is still there, which means that we are looking at something which is really related to something going on in neurons, not vascularization. But is it? That's a big question. And that's maybe where I need to help, because I'll show you that it might be in the future of water. So this, I'm new here, so I'm learning. So water diffusion is linked to tissue microstructure, and let me show you some uh, uh, explanation for that. So we are, according to this, we are switching from a paradigm, which is a neurovascular movie, to something which could be the neuromechanical self-swelling and diffusion of water. So, let's see how it works. There is evidence now, it's very clear, that there is a relationship between decreased diffusion and self-swelling. I mentioned the stroke, so the stroke self-swell, and, uh, and 
and I said diffusion decreases. So this is very well established. If you change the osmolality of the tissue uh, to reduce some swelling, again diffusion decreases. This is all the stimulation using potassium ions, for instance. Again, what we see is decreased diffusion and cell swelling. So there is a relationship. We don't know so far how to explain it, but there is a relationship. On the other hand, it's very well established that there are changes in the shape of the neurons when they get activated. This is, for instance, an experiment from Tasaki, where he's measuring the membrane position of, of neurons, and when the neuron gets activated, there is an action of potential propagating. You see a bump on the membrane surface. So there, there, there are really mechanical effects. This is, uh, I go fast, but that's not the point. With optical imaging, we can record also signals coming from the hippocampus, and when the, the cells are activated, you see a sharp response that means the photons which are going to the tissue, they are the deviate, change angle, but when neurons get activated, the deviation is different, which means that something has changed in the structure of the tissue, so that the photons have to change and uh, the course. And this is usually uh, understood as swelling occurring in the tissue. So you see, activation is linked to cell swelling. Cell swelling is linked to decreased diffusion. So now we have to, to put everything into uh, coincidence or into phase, <laughs> and, and that's, that's not easy. So let me show you my, my ideas here. First, and that's why I'm that so interested in your work and especially what the Jerry has done. What is known now very clearly is that we cannot explain what the diffusion in tissue by caution. So it's not controversial. That's very clear. Everybody is not even controversial. If you if diffusion was caution, uh, we would get this part that I want to explain again a straight line. It's not a straight line, it's curved, it's curved. So one way, one way, that's the only, not the only one, and to explain this curvature is to consider And uh, it 
this leads to sort of expansion. So to, to prove even more that, we've done experiments recently. So this is the model, this is the membrane with water molecules which could be more structured. We should, we should consider also the cytoskeleton, which is very dense here. And here we have proteins with hydration uh, water, expansion with cold water. So we have used this acute animal in Asia, California, which is very famous because it was used by Kendall to get, to get his Nobel Prize on memory. The beauty of this animal uh, is that we know all notes. There are 20,000 on it. Uh, we have 100 millions. So we know all of them, we know where they are located, and uh, many are people. So we can really see. So we have, uh, we are lucky because we have a 17 test data net. It's the highest fixed rate for MRI in the world. It's used for small animals. And we measure the diffusion of water inside the neurons, inside each individual neuron, and at the tissue level. Big surprise. Not for me, but for my colleagues. When we measure diffusion and we induce cell swelling and we look at the uh, uh, tissue level, we see diffusion of water goes down, exactly as I said earlier. But we measure diffusion inside the cells, it is going on, and a lot. So, how could we explain that inside the cells there is increased diffusion and the tissue level of deeper diffusion? So, uh, because we are also new scientists, we did something a little bit more central. We use water, which is a, a drug which is interfering with the sodium potassium pump of the membranes. Same effect at the tissue level, decrease water diffusion, but inside each individual neuron increase diffusion. So, what is the difference between tissue and intracellular water? It's water next to the membranes. So, at this stage, uh, that's what we think that um, in order to explain these uh, full results, uh, we have to consider that uh, there's uh, the water next to the membranes, it's only a difference, a pool between the two, uh, the two experiments we've done, two measurement kinds we've done, and there must be some water molecules uh, interacting with the membranes uh, responsible for this decrease in water diffusion. So, uh, this is a cartoon now. We measure it so during activation in the human brain. There is a 4.5 uh, change in balance between slow and fast water diffusion. So I, I use the term freezing. It looks like that some water is freezing, and one water would mean that this is the increase of the water next to the membranes. However, we should not consider that this running occurs in, uh, in uh, as Cells are bad as that's not true. So, in fact, um, neurons have thousands of dendrites, and of the dendrites, they are smart, so very small um, um, uh, physical things, right? uh, which are dynamic. So, they spread, they shrink all the time. This is highly dynamic. So, the swelling we don't care at this level, and based on the calculation from Jerry's book, uh, I explained that, well, when cells get activated, um, the cytoskeleton has to be a very important role. If you remove the cytoskeleton, there is no more activation of these cells. So the cytoskeleton, the, the membrane of the, of the inside membrane will increase the surface. Cytoskeleton also will open up, which will expose more negative charges. And this is how water molecules can get sucked up into the cells and also get more structure because it are close. So the hypothesis I'm putting forward now is electromechanical proof. Activation is due to thermal water expansion, cytoskeleton, and increase of water ordering. And how is it possible? There's no creation of membrane. This is a very famous dish in, uh, in Japan, and uh, it's funny how it is obtained uh, with Yuba. So, and in fact, we have to consider that the zero spine, zero the membrane is folded. So it's just an expansion, unfolding, folding, unfolding. So it's not no creation of the neuron. But an interesting point is that if there is freezing, uh, there should be production of heat. That was also finished. And um, maybe as it is, because it will take us longer. We have measured also the refractory index of water itself, and we see that during activation, that in the cell swelling, there is a change in the uh, refractory index, which could be also related to um, uh, change in water structure. So this idea that water structure it has a role in brain function is not mine, it's not new. It started long ago, as I'm sure you know the work of uh, Linus Pauling, and uh, where he showed this, this proposed that the effect of xenon, for instance, and some anesthetic agents was uh, explained by the dynamics of water molecules and interaction with normal potential. You know, of course, uh, um, Peter Agri, who discovered aquaporins, and um, Quadroids are very smart because they, are, they break hydrogen bonds 
uh, in order for water molecules to go one by one to the water. <laughs> and uh, there are many aquaporins which have been discovered. There are no other, so far, there is no aquaporin on their own, but there are many on their own astrocytes. And recently it has been pointed out that uh, some drugs which, for which uh, function was not understood are linked to aquaporins, drugs which are used for epilepsy, for instance, or drugs which are used uh, for mind. So, clearly, uh, movement of water to the membrane are, are important. So, this is the last uh, uh, slide. Um, I think we have to consider water, which is 90% of the molecules we have in our brain, not only as a passive, uh, a passive molecule to understand the brain. I didn't talk today about the process of the tomography, but again, people have used radioactive water. With all the from our we use water which has been somewhat magnetized, like hydrogen in the light has been magnetized. Now what I'm trying to convey as a message is that water might be an active player for brain activation. So let me give you some uh, um, crazy ideas. So water might have a role in the third depolarization action potentials, as I explained. Um, I said that during um, activation of neurons, there is increase in blood flow. We don't know why. Egyptians were considering that the brain was just a radiator. So they, they, they used to take the brain out of the movies because they didn't consider it was just a <coughs> So, uh, according to what they said, if this is true, uh, when neurons get activated and they say swelling, there must be an increase in temperature. And yes, it has been measured. There is a temperature increase when they activated neurons. So my proposal is that there is an increase in blood flow that we see is just to cool down the brain where it is activated. And uh, to tease my Japanese colleague who invented all the fMRI and said you make a mistake, you should have called it called the fMRI. Yeah. And uh, so it's not really for energy. And the last provocative thought I have is that physics is always reversible. So activate the source, you change the shape. If you change the shape, you activate. So I consider that many neuron spines are peat lobe and fruit users. And that means that if you activate some neurons in a in the cluster of neurons, as they change the shape, all the source will feel immediately this mechanical effect and get depolarized. So the propagation will be much faster than using synaptic transmission. That's what I call wireless connectivity. So I don't want to say that we don't have synapses and so on, because they are very important, but it might be that within a cells which are touching each other, this mechanism is important, and once information has been processed, then it is exported to uh, other regions using synapse transmission. Okay, and uh, just, to, just to, to show you that in order to continue exploring this field, we are creating now the integral process of just learn a magnet for um, for people, so it is the first in the world, very powerful system, it's almost ready, it will be delivered to neurons in, in less than one year, hopefully, and uh, uh, so it, uh, it's really a, a mere level of, uh, of uh, physics and technology, so you see there are uh, some pancakes which are put together, and, uh, and the magnet will be very big, with 5 meter in length, and, and uh, we have to produce uh,
important player of the clear cells, and they uh, regulate the flow of blood. Did you look also at changes in the diffusion of water in clear cells? That's a very important point. In fact, there are more, much more uh, liar cells and neurons. And as, as I, I said, with the really resolution we have, uh, one millimeter, we cannot tolerate <coughs> liar cells and neurons. When I say so, swelling, to be honest, it could be liar cells swelling. I, I don't have the proof that it's all neurons. Okay, I asked that please, and do they have some clear that please? There is no liar cells in that region. So for that region, it's neurons by itself.